I'm sure we'll get some control. If you don't think it's me, I'm now pulling the fuck to your face in that hole. Thank you. 
from the Australian people a dark insight into the intentions of the government with the sense of the internet. But what stood out about the list was that half of the five points were not related to child board, rather included online poker sites, YouTube links, regular game and trade porn sites, Wikipedia entries, euthanasia sites, religious sites, fetish sites, and in a bizarre script, two websites, two small Australian businesses, a two operator, and a dentist. Earlier this year, WikiLeaks released five files, revealing that mass interception in higher populations is not only a reality, but also useful knowledge of telecommunications providers. Users' physical locations can be tracked if they're carrying a mobile phone. Their microphones can be remotely activated and record conversations. Even if it's only by, even if the phone's only on standby. In a world with airstrikes and drones murdering suspects without trials, where is it headed? Another release this year by WikiLeaks and the Globe was the Global Intelligence Files. Millions of emails stolen by the anonymous from the pirate, uh, sorry, sorry, from the private intelligence organisation Stratfor or the Australian Defence Force. Trustwire uses information from surveillance cameras across the world to record and store on a central database in a secret location to be analysed automatically with other intelligence information like facial recognition. Basically, tracking your every move and using algorithms to determine certain behaviours and identify a map of who is friends with who and where were you likely to be on Tuesday morning. Western Australian groups to narrow the range of thought. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at very least, not a single human being will be alive that could understand such conversations we're having now. The whole climate of the thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought, sympathy, or philosophy with unconsciousness. We're here today to stand up for our freedom, which brings me to a surprisingly rare ruling by the Southern District New York Court in the United States. two days ago to the National Defence Authorisation Act, or NDAA. A group of writers, journalists and activists whose work regularly requires them to engage in writing, speech and associated activities protected by the First Amendment that testify credibly to having an actual reasonable fear that their activities will subject them to indefinite military detention for to the NDAA. In summary, we the people won. I feel like that within 24 hours of Barack Obama's administration announced that they would appeal the decision to stop the NDAA in the Supreme Court. Judge Forrest gave a 104 page response, which I recommend anyone closely watching Australian National Security Law 3. He said, How about a YouTube video? Where is the line between what governments consider journalistic reporting and propaganda? He said, Who will make such determination? Will there be an office to subject to the articles evaluate speeches in order to make judgments on the spectrum of where support is modest and substantial. What are plaintiffs, the journalist and activist, Alexa O'Brien, who was on the Oscar episode of Julian Clark's The World Tomorrow TV show? Alexa had written about the United States tables released by WikiLeaks, about the persecution of Julian Assange, the court proceedings of Bradley Manning, and many other WikiLeaks related topics, all of which were referenced in the response. Alexa was told the court how she had become aware of Wicked's releases, as Strafford was working with current and former intelligence agents to try to her involvement with Massachusetts through U.S. Great. ...and they were quite apparent. Julian Sandy which we have reasonable evidence to suggest was under the instruction of the United States government. Files of Julian Assange and files of this morning national passport data. We mentioned several sovereign Aboriginal nations are considering giving Julian Assange refuge and censoring their nation. In December 2010, Within days of WikiLeaks releasing Tablegate, a quarter of a million tables between the United States 
entities and the federal department to restrain Prime Minister Mo putting in front of his actions illegal. The former Attorney General Robert McClellan sent to cancel his task force and jumped on the phone to his former ALP co-worker, former Visa employee and now Vice President of NASCAR, David Masters, to fight against global all this is for someone who hasn't been charged with a single crime, let alone a fair trial. It's a misconduct to answer the United Kingdom or in Sweden to guarantee that he will not be. The Australian government refuses to even a fifth of the right. The only time seeks truth and freedom. They took the truth out and fighting the people proposed. As I mentioned, the NDA okay. We need to unite, stand to contain our freedom, and get back those who've already been taken away from us. In freedom, not fear. Thank you, Matt Watt. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Robert Tuck. Uh, ABC University. Please welcome him to the mic, Dr. Robert Charles. Today I am going to discuss three, uh, three things. The misuse of public surveillance uh, a public owned public surveillance footage by the New South Wales Police, focusing on a case study of Wollongong. And Wollongong, for those who don't know, is about an hour and a half south of here, major um, city south of here. The second thing I want to talk about is the policy and messages in Wollongong with local council. And thirdly, grassroots plunging people. So why is, why is Wollongong uh, an interesting case study? Uh, it has been operated by the It has at least two and a half times the number of uh, cameras than the city of Sydney uh, uh, council. And 11 is where my case study began, and this is the day the New South Wales Police Association, otherwise known as the Police Union, Wollongong uh, City Council, CCTV, that street violence was uh, escalating out of control in Wollongong. in the New South Wales, Bellewood, Mercury, and other media across the state Ban this misperception. Video referred to a five minutes in length. It was a compilation of stockpiled CCTV footage that dated from 2008 to 2010. When the police, uh, the police union posted the video on his blog, he said to quote the CCTV footage, this is the footage the politicians don't want you to see. The attorney taking the police union's work for it, local and story. While dates appear in many of the frames of the video, showing all of these walls and, and violent incidents were happening in the Channel 10, citing the footage, made remarkable cops like John Mogg going from one license venue to also victims a brawling mob and reportedly outnumbered by thousands of people every weekend on the streets of Wollongong. And we hear this kind of well in other parts of the city here in Sydney. So the because of the way press time, collapsing two years worth of footage into the now, the media did not challenge the actions of the police on this or the merits of their case. By the time we get images ended up in the media, they were far removed from their original format. 
the original group described in a compilation sexual system of popular impact of urgency to deal with an imminent or an oil. Police drew on this footage in order to bolster their demands to increase policing powers. Scott Weber argued to a fast tracking of a section 79 application by local police to the New South Wales government. Now this application would see licensed venues in Wollongong placed under greater restrictions on opening hours and alcohol to be given hours to move people on in the street. So in the Fairfax Court, um, member for Wollongong, Noreen Hayes, is the only candidate running for the city of Wollongong to question the police union's claim. All the other candidates interviewed by, by the newspaper Video produced broad political solidarity, and the police's claim, uh, the police's concerns were endorsed far and wide by all the civic leaders down, down the coast. The Keneally Labour the government and the election result after, um, following a major swing in favour of the Barry O'Farrell-led um, Liberal Party. The papers made 15 months before in November 2009. This claim is supported by, by the head of Wollongong Police, Superintendent Cole Fitchman, or to the story that is yet to be uncovered. Questions remain about why part of the leaked video has footage dating from this after November 2009. So there's about 30 or 40 seconds of this video that was taken from February 2010. Other questions yet to be resolved include what does the original tape look like, how much of that footage is the same or different added later, and most importantly, who added the footage if it's not part of the original application. So these are all questions that remain. But the public, the public still did not understand which segment of the tape comes to a national media publicity corporation called Essential Media Communications. Their offices are here in Sydney. Social media uploads the tape the day before the campaign begins, so this isn't an, an organised publicity campaign for extra police power. The company has offices around Australia uh, and the Labor Party and other um, organisations for previous and subsequent publicity campaigns. The questions remain too about how the how Scott um, about Scott Webber's claim if the video arrives from a group of quote, concerned citizens, anonymously. Who are these mysterious concerned citizens with purported links to essential media corporations? During the dot. The police claim that releasing the citizens of New South Wales more broadly is a way of pressuring the New South Wales government to act in a situation that is supposedly borrowing out of control. So this argument hinges on whether New South Wales police are able to show without question the crime was in fact violent, out of control and getting higher. That crime in Melbourne is actually under control but decreasing. And here's the onion. New South Wales Bureau of Crime Stats point four percent of crime for the four years um, in Wollongong in the postcode 2500 area leading up to the release of this case. I'll say that again, 30.4% drop in crime for the four years leading up to the release of this case. While there's no statistics for the nightclub in question are, um, please, to consider their suggestion that crime is spiraling, spiraling out of control. So in the first, if the metric uh, accurately, at least on seven occasions, this event that happened when the police union campaign began. Why? Because that's a crucial campaign and a hearing in Fairfax coverage. These facts were inconvenient for the spin imposed by the Fairfax, uh, by the newspaper's editor. Instead, Fairfax encouraged vigilantism. The Mercury front page said police have. Please say our politicians are failing and must be introduced. This is the newspaper editor speaking. We agree. It's to back. 
to replay that, replay that CD, CD, the world put off shame. The Mercury portrayed a series of community disharmony, the perception of the inclusion of the video released on its back. Finally, in Mulligan, the CD has been dropping the Mulligan police team. Here, sediment and dismay over the leaked footage reaffirmed the drop in time. Some are even uncomfortable mentioning what happened under the superintendent's watch. His silence remains the police behaviour in this episode conducive to officers, the officers of the New South Wales Police Service. Is this a case for the Police Integrity Commission? Remarkably, Paul Stewart has been filling in as Deputy Commissioner of New South Wales Police. So let's talk about change. Reaffirming is that Wollongong Council, in, a, in announcing a motion three weeks ago to the former public surveillance system, the new system in Council operating Changes in, in the line with New South Wales operating standards for like the government operating system is, is the exception rather than the rule for control them. Consider the city council back in the police act. Perhaps it is because council has recognised that the law um, has failed to protect citizens and residents from the new piece of government owned, i.e., public owned, this is what it's re owned, but for the purposes in which people panic about the going out of control. State government, the laws do use to protect our privacy from unauthorised distribution from police and judges. So when you've got to imagine you're with a group of friends or colleagues, perhaps making your way home from a club or you're working time. As you walk out, motion um, time. Your reaction is to protect yourself. The next day, your footage is in every time and time for you as a drunken brawler. Then the reality is that there is nothing you can do about this. It is too late to stop the footage being circulated. It's on the internet and then the damage is already done. And this five minute video I was talking about before now has more than 19,000 hits on the YouTube account it was uploaded. With people from all over the world can pull into the video footage. So two weeks ago, the Council of the Union voted to speak a major overhaul of the government to see the city in New South Wales. The changes of the community. Ideally, the new laws, if taken up by the state government, will have a ripple effect impacting local councils across the state. The changes will have statewide consequences. The new laws are expected um, from the Privacy and Personal Information Act, New South Wales 1998, also known as PIPA. New South Wales police are not required to comply with the, with the information protection principles. In other words, police are excluded from the, this particular act, from any repercussion, from the misuse, their misuse of footage, from leaking it to the media. Basically, this means two police can do whatever they want with your image without repercussions in government. Being introduced from the new draft code of practice that I've been involved in, 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 in drafting with the council and the proactive approach in protecting the civil liberties of members of the public. And this is concept, and I've learned written about this in my blog. Uh, the return of my first paper was given in Wollongong in February 2012. The people depicted in and affected by the work of Wollongong CCTV cities by the police are victims of false associations. So my argument is that Wollongong Council and the New South Wales government have a moral 
um, obligation to protect residents against false association, which basically means from being unfairly misrepresented and stereotyped by the police, and especially without their consent. Because current New South Wales privacy rules is normally associated with public surveillance footage owned by local government, false association is as much a legislative issue as it is an ethical one. This issue is an important one for civil liberties, and the questions are thus, how can citizens be made to feel so unprotected from the law because of the actions of New South Wales police? How is it that citizens can be made to and can be made to uh, feel unwelcome in their own public space, day or night, because of the ongoing risk of leaked surveillance footage. New legislation is required in New South Wales um, for CCTV. Now, just to finish off, I wanted to touch on um, some, some grassroots ideas for resistances to the, to the proliferation of public surveillance technology. So while many of the campaigns by organisations like WikiLeaks or others may seek to undertake a top-down approach, to resisting the spread of public surveillance technology, my success well, so far um, in lobbying local council reveals possibilities to create change from the bottom up from, with grassroots pressure. And with with cities, etc., has thus far been somewhat successful. There are other methods grassroots activists can take to protect surveillance technology and to shift power back to the hands of the many rather than the few. One is the backlog approach. It's a method uh, that involves the plugging up of, surveillance, of the surveillance regime through legal and legitimate means. It took one security provider, for example, a whole two days of work just to find a couple of minutes of footage of me. I requested the footage under what's called the Government Information and Public Access Act. It used to be known as Freedom of Information Act, but in 2009 it became the new act. Also known as GIPA, G-I-P-A. So imagine then if you had a mass public, you get up with a group of the public surveillance. Second, there's also the option of taking a more artistic approach. It's the building control of the lens by Using the the public in ways other than that presented authorities that own the footage, perception of why and how CCTV is used and how it can be used. The demonstrated examples of this include video stripping, in which you can pick up CCTV. Um, uh, streaming footage by a wireless receiver, then there is the effort of this whole film by Marnie Luke called Facebook, where the entire film is made as much in the way of Thirdly, there is the, what I like to call the show me the money approach, the show me the money, which is probably a good one for those concerned about public surveillance, but I also find to take out the activist for the record by showing me the money is asking all local council one simple question. It does what it says you do, but it takes its time. The lack of the reviewing on council does not collect statistics on its CCTV system, therefore cannot prove it reduces its time. Furthermore, NARA or Shell Haven Council, which is so kind, actually, in the areas where the council is. This leads me to my final point. A lot of times where a national the taxpayer is on, on CCTV. In 2007, the Howard government handed over millions of dollars to local councils all around Australia to a home system uh, measure. The program is actually called the National There are virtually no studies around the world that show studies show that to the uh, friction um, and disarmament between different social groups, particularly young people and minorities. But most public surveillance has been in one study from 2011. The government's own research institute, the Institute for Criminology, has just the latest 
figures and resources available. It said federal government and um, department, it said safety to modest impact on crime reduction at best. A modest impact on crime reduction at best. And this is also in line with international and local Are into the wastage of taxpayers' money on a false technology. If social people does not reduce crime, party is a very provocative name. I poor hygiene and but then there's the other pirate, the digital ignores the copyright monopoly. The label pirate has been given to those who share culture and knowledge for free in private. This label was used by the middlemen who felt that their profits were slipping away as what they provide is no longer required. It has continued to be used by those too complacent to adapt as a derogatory term to shame us, to make us afraid to throw us in the sea. We have claimed that title for ourselves. Yes, we are pirates. Yes, we share music and movies and books and information and knowledge. As a global society, we are so well connected through the internet, crossing borders of nations and, and the vast geography of our world, that free distribution of culture and knowledge has become the societal norm. So what does sharing music have to do with civil rights and freedom? That part is not immediately apparent. Within this new instantaneously, globally connected marketplace, the intellectual property industry is to the world to interfere with our rights and remove our freedoms. The lobbying is a fear-driven, last-ditch effort carried out in the name of saving the bloated profits of their no longer sustainable business. The business of monopolised local distribution of cultural work. The value of this work is also value depending on where you live, and then with arbitrary delays to increase demand. This is where Pirate Party as a movement began. A voice speaking out against cultural oppression, highlighting the ever-growing laws that are restricting our freedom and perverting our privacy. But the protection of civil rights and the pushback against the middle man has grown into a far more robust movement. Around the world, there are increasingly abominable legislative, legislative changes being pushed forward to protect profits and, of course, the ever-looming fear of bad guys. As Pirate Party Australia formed and began to grow, we realised that this was not just a problem for a few nerds on the fringe. And it wasn't just music and movies. It was and is human rights. The right to privacy from arbitrary surveillance. The right to freedom of assembly. The right to assumed innocence. The right to freedom of association. And the right to freedom from censorship. The the word politicians and government can so often to mean incompetence, corruption, lies, and secrecy. Perhaps pirates, rather ironically, can stand for transparency, honesty, protection of rights, trust, not surveillance, the death of censorship, protection of democratic government, and freedom, not fear. As we commemorate the 11th anniversary of the tragic September 11 attacks, we also reflect on the climate of fear that has been exploited and has allowed the health agencies to pass controversial, unnecessary and unbalanced laws that erode privacy and other fundamental freedoms. Our right to privacy perverted, our access to data scrutinized, and our communications and content under the constant threat of censorship. Our fundamental human rights are under attack but not by terrorists or dictators. We and our representatives are given rights to being attacked by our fears. I truly wish that this was a conspiracy theorist fever dream, 
that the governing powers of this nation appear to be leaving Joe Joe Rose's 1984 as an instruction manual for the future of our society. The novel that gave us the expression Big Brother, that describes a sense of culture, a society controlled by fear, and constantly at war, was a bit a prediction of our society. A few short years ago, Australia was rocked by plans to censor our internet. It was claimed to be in the interest of protecting the children and stopping the bad guys. Realistically, it was a poorly thought out plan to filter out any information deemed illegal. However, not dealing with illegal content, there's also anything that has been refused classification for this and anything that has been deemed inappropriate for a reasonable person by an unelected, uh, an unelected classification board. The vagueness of this plot, coupled by its ability to be easily circumvented by school children who have grown up with internet filtration at their educational institutions, made this system not only useless for child safety, but also highlighted to us its true purpose. A system like this, which checks all web requests for access permission, requires a central point of processing for those requests. Regardless of something being on a list, your request for that page would be logged by software for a minimum the time it takes to process that request, and it would be child's play to simply extend the logging period. It also puts in place a system which could be easily manipulated by future regimes for political censorship. We called it for what it was. It was an encroachment of privacy and a push towards draconian censorship. This plan was rejected by the citizens of this country. The government was told where to stick it. Unfortunately, they just put it on the back burner. Fast forward to today. The sweeping agenda is no longer hidden under the guise of a filter to protect the children. Instead, there are vague press releases, parliamentary and departments of the government and their staff, discussing plans to just install an arbitrary data retention system. Something to speed over all of your mail, scan it, reseal it, and send it in its way. With the recent push towards cloud storage, this system would collect any and all communication online and suddenly starts to collect information like private letters to your loved ones, internet banking activities, online shopping, business communications and documents, family and photos, whatever you are, whatever you are listening to, and whoever you are talking to. All kept on a file with your name on it, held on a server in the hands of a private company for two years. Just in case you happen to be a murderer, child abuser, terrorist, fraudster, or pirate. This is not the treatment of a law-abiding citizen. This is the warrantless treatment of a wiretap criminal suspect. And then with the warrantless wiretap with every citizen in the police, comes the chilling effect on the communications of the nation living in fear. It happened in Germany when this was attempted. People avoided talking about politics for fear of being targeted. In the long term, this leads to more oppressive laws slowly creeping in, or suddenly there is no free voice questioning the people's involvement. Can we take data for keywords? Sure. Run psychological profiling software on every citizen looking for pre-crime behavior? Why not? Then we have the issue of then we have the issue of whistleblowers and journalist sources being tracked and recorded. With the further suppression of communication under government control, corruption is free to run rampant without fear of exposure because everyone is too scared to talk about it. The communication recorded and scanned for keywords. We can see what America does with whistleblowers and journalist sources when they are exposed. Of course, these plans for data retention are all paid in detail, either intentionally or not. There's very little information on what kind of data is to be scanned and kept. There are mixed responses, none of which match the proposal, nor the technical definition. The saddest part of all is that the National Security Inquiry proposals are merely extending an amended bill of similar imposition that has already passed through our Senate the Cybercrime Amendment Bill. 
allows for this data to be restored, allows for this data to be stored the private, there is at least some consolation with this bill, however, as it requires a request that is made by some law enforcement before they start recording. And it's only doable with a warrant to be to view the data. Nevertheless, it is obviously it is already a reality in Australia. Just think about it. The retaining of your data for six months on request from police has already been approved by the Senate. The Federal Attorney General, Nicola Ruston, recently spoke of the need for balance between ensuring law enforcement have the right investigative tools required to protect the community and the need to maintain the individual privacy. She also spoke about the fact that government staff are confused, exploited, or corrupted into providing access to systems via clever social engineering. We have seen how well the government can protect these systems. With the internet social list, listing almost instantaneously as if it was held securely by the government within a kitchen colander. At this point, she felt that the case still had to be made for data retention, and we could breathe a short sigh of relief with the knowledge that she was not convinced. For a potential hacker or identity thief, a retention system itself is a treasure trove of information, a high value target. Considering that it will be kept in the hands of private telecommunications employees, the very same risk Watson eloquently described them presents an even greater risk for privately owned systems. In a sudden backflip, however, Ms. Watson has come out in support of a two-year data retention plan, but not just on request. She wants to record everyone for two years. The wish list exposed in the National Security Inquiry shows that this is only the tip of the iceberg. The government wants agencies to have permission to hack computers nearby to one from which a potential crime may have been committed. They want to be able to plant software and other data on them, and for AVO to be given a free pass when it comes to computer networks. In a How can she envision setting up a system for data retention, knowing these systems can be and are being It suggests that you have nothing to fear from privacy invasion if you are not a criminal. To these people, I say, take off your pants and hand me your wallet. If you have nothing to hide in your pants and you are happy for all of your private data that can be recorded by a private company, this should not be a troubling request. Those with little understanding of how these systems operate argue that only the metadata would be recorded. So they'll only record who, where, and when you communicated. Um, but not what you said. The reality of communication on the internet is that the vast majority of email and private messaging is carried out via web and or cloud services. And there is no way to separate the metadata from the message. All data sent to this service and private control is encapsulated in the same way and sent to the service with no markers indicating whether it's meta or other. If metadata is needed, then the entire data session needs to be recorded. If a fraction of missing data is present, it renders the whole work. Any information that's collected by this system has the high possibility of being encrypted by the end user, especially its private documents and business communications, rendering the collected information useless. But that's okay. Extra legislative changes have gone ahead the right to avoid self-incrimination has been thrown out of the window. Fines and even jail are suggested for refusing to decrypt data. Did you remember a password used two years ago to send a document to a business partner? Can you tell me your password from two weeks ago? How many of you have had to reset their password in the last few days because you forgot? 
Jupiter Big Sister Watson describes the mandatory data of attending to ensure that vital investigative tools are not lost. Essentially implying that today's tools are sufficient. She invokes the murder of Cabinet MP John Newman in 1994, a case that was successfully resolved, investigative tool by to modern technology. She says that without the extra legislation of recording everyone's online activities through data retention, like no other democratic society ever has, the capability to use the legislation and proven tools that we already have will somehow be lost. I find this to be an appalling threat to privacy. In fact, I find it to be a complete perversion of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, to which Australia was an instrumental article 12 of this declaration, which is stated quite plainly. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, home, family, or correspondence. Data retention and censorship both violate this right, this fundamental right, this right without which democracy cannot exist. So democracy demands freedom, freedom from arbitrary surveillance, freedom from censorship, freedom of association, and above all, freedom Thank you very much, David Campbell from the Park Party, President of the Park Party, in fact. Now, our next speaker is an internet activist, Dan Jones, who is going to come and talk to us about uh, data retention and false decryption. Let's hear it for Dan. Hey guys. Um, yeah, it's a really good crowd, and uh, yes, we can get to know like, as Marty Reed said, if any other be the small group of people who pay you the world, like, never doubt that a small group of people who pay you the world. Um, yeah, so I find like this, this, right now there's a lot of talk about the latest, um, the plans for data retention in Australia. Um, I was under the like, um, incident with and they offered to pay me money in order to like pay for um, piece of information on on the anti-war movement, which is like um and, and you know I, I have got no criminal history, I like I don't have I have no conviction and um yeah, but it's yeah. I mean the government the government does actually that was that was a bit of a revelation too. Um, but I actually don't mind Nicola Ruffin, um, because her, her arguments are quite easy to dismantle. Um, she recently posted a video up on YouTube, um, in response to a lot of the voices that people here are raising on the web, and, and, um, a lot of the, uh, obviously she's steering the pinch from our opposition to the national security inquiry, and the, the, the data attention proposals in the fourth description world. Um, but Nicola, to quote Nicola Ruffin, um, get up saying that if we store the contents of every site that you have visited, is false. We only store the metadata and not the content. But metadata is precisely what intelligence agencies have always wanted to collect. Metadata is what, is what sites you visit. She's very careful with her language. She says that they will not store the content of the site that you visit. But they will store the fact that you visited Google, and because the Google took the search string in the URL, they'll search, they'll store the fact that you search for this at this time. So this data is a profile of all of the things that you are interested in over time. But you've got to watch the, te the, the language that you use. She'll be talking about content. It metadata, the, 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 is, in aggregate, a, a profile of your, of your interest and who you can mail to a friend. And I send that, and we're sending emails regularly, the fact that there are many emails from me to that friend know that we have a strong connection. And if these connections are activists, you know, planning um, against, you know, the latest piece of government legislation, um, you know, this, 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 this could be used by the intelligence um, agencies to, to, like, you know, stifle dissent. And don't think they, they won't stifle dissent. I, 
how to do to this myself when I was asked to be an informant for an intelligence group in a sense to pay in order to give them money and the uh, give them information on the anti-war movement. Um, which is something that's not really talked about because obviously when the government talks about it, it's always about terrorism, it's about child porn, it's about um, pirates, it's about uh, criminals. Um, but the law is blind. It applies equally to everybody. And if they're retaining this data, it will be the same on everybody. Um, Rico Rastanete says, the world in a changing world where technology is ever evolving. We no longer have to use the phone and the fax machine to communicate. Um, and in fact, right now, I'm communicating to you over the media with YouTube. Um, but criminals and terrorists have also got these benefits. So, criminals and terrorists have these benefits because of the law, law enforcement and the intelligence agency. It's like technology is changing, so we need new laws. No, technology is changing, so technology is changing. So the police have the police have more power too because they have you know better computing because they have access to this like the it's the idea that because technology changes we need new laws is 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 a, is a fallacy and it should be attacked. Um, the other thing that Nicola Roxon said in that video is that when the Howard government tried to change national security legislation, it's come behind closed doors. Diary to myself. Um, so I might write about you know, anarchism and overthrowing the government and you know, a whole bunch of different you know crazy things because human imagination is possible. It, it has the most crazy possibilities. And I wouldn't want anyone to read this. This is my thoughts to myself. And but if I put this on on, on on Dropbox, what I've done is I've just communicated that to a server over in you know uh, California or or in Europe or something, and in that very act of communicating, of, of, of writing thoughts to myself on a piece of paper, I've communicated, because that's how the cloud is structured, that's like the way that the contemporary web works. And so there's no wonder if the um, distinction between action and uh, in, in the way that we use computers in our daily life. And so if you make a crime out of Failure to assist in the decryption of communication, you can make a crime out of somebody keeping their thoughts to themselves. And there's a word for this. The word is thought crime. And the National Security Inquiry is proposing to institute thought crime. As soon, and as soon as it's impossible to keep one's thoughts to oneself without penalty of jail, you punish somebody for keeping um, so that's like people to think about that, and um, obviously Nicola Ruffin is feeling the pinch on this, otherwise she wouldn't have responded in this way, and I'd like her to keep responding because it's, it's kind of amusing, I mean, give us what you've got, it's, it's not, it's not, 
We're not collecting uh, data on all your web browsing. We're not collecting the content of your web browsing history. We're just collecting the metadata from your web browsing history, which is, of course, every website that you visited. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I hope you keep talking. Uh, I hope Nicola Rossi would make another video because um, because uh, I'd like to I'd like to work with the one who's the next argument. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you very much, Dan Jones, internet activist. And our final speaker for this afternoon is Simon Poole from the Pirate Party. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Um, there have been many changes to national security legislation since the attack of September 11, 2001. Every year, both major parties have proposed more draconian security laws, which have been passed without discussion and with that partisan support. The current National Security Review has been the first time the wider public has had the opportunity to comment, and currently did, with literally hundreds of submissions. I'm going to go through the proposals not already covered by David and Dan. The government claims that motivation behind the, these changes are, not, are to modernise and streamline Australian security laws. Continuing the laws have been updated more regularly than every time since 2001, it's hard to see how this is true. There is no evidence of any increased crime since 2001. In fact, there's been a marked decline. Part of the justification for increased increase surveillance powers have been the changing in expectations of free privacy in society. The government uses the logic that because people share more of their personal information on social media, they don't care so much about their privacy anymore. Just because we share more info about what we do online, we do choose to voluntarily share that information with our friends. According to a study on Facebook, only one third of Facebook users expect what's published on Facebook to be considered public. The other two thirds of Facebook users consider everything they publish on Facebook private. This means that two thirds still have a reasonable have an expectation of privacy, whether that's a reasonable expectation or not. If there was a, there was a social media, it was actually impossible to share in the way that people do on Facebook, except for one one on one or face to face faces. The idea that this means everyone's okay with being monitored is a massive stretch. One of them is being pushed by ASIO in a power grab by Australian intelligence services, backed by media and defence companies. The way the government is acting, you think they are elected by spies rather than Australian people. The National Security Inquiry discussion paper claims that Australian privacy must continue to be protected, yet most of the proposals are designed specifically to weaken already weak protection broken down into proposals the government are advocating, proposals the government wish to advance, and proposals that are expressly seeking an opinion of the community. So how I interpret it, what they expect to pass, what they want to pass, and what the security services hope they pass. Part of the difficulty in applying to the inquiry terms was just how poorly worded the entire terms of reference and discussion paper was. It was quite difficult to know what were some of the proposals actually meant. For example, the data retention proposal that David already spoke about was not explained in any detail. The only safe way to respond to the inquiry was to assume the worst of every single proposal they put forward. There's, there was no way to know what the government actually wanted in these cases. Okay, now I'm going to run through a list of some of the uh, worst proposals that they put up in the National Security Inquiry. They have worked to just a million things from seven years to either one or three, depending on how you read it. Before surveillance can be deployed against Australian citizens. This will lead to surveillance being deployed on a much greater basis than it currently is. Uh, one of the better uh, proposals is to reduce the number of agencies able to conduct surveillance. The issue with this, however, is that every single agency who had surveillance powers previously was still going to access that information through one of the four agencies with approval. But that's a shame we the wrong information, to include more information about the nature of surveillance to actually help to make sure that our privacy is not being necessarily breached. But they do this to us for removing administration information designed to make sure that our surveillance is not being used to corrupt activity. More information about the nature of surveillance is a good thing. That said, security services are more or less corrupt than they are in the past. So, procedures for limited corruption is still in the 
Thank you, Lou. I'm not going to make laugh of this. But I'm trying to argue the existence of that collection in society. She also talks to me later on the first half of 2009 called Give You an Act of Corruption. Give You a Sweeping Room and then Powers, the Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General has to spend a warrant to get a very early stimulant for 11 days in time with a sick man without judicial oversight. This could be used for her last three or four times, with her rule of law, and in general, the reason of judicial oversight was a constant thing throughout the inquiry. Uh, the story is funded to by consistently demanding judicial oversight to be put in place. Uh, the second level of uh, proposals that the government aren't pushing as hard include creating a single uh, communication minister that all forms of surveillance can be deployed against anyone with a surveillance warrant placed on them. These are some of the obligations so they push the cost of surveillance onto ISP. And I'd like to extend the regulatory regime to include other uh, internet companies like social media. Uh, the main person alone, uh, the main person alone, uh, allowing people to investigate individuals regardless of where they are. So I'd like to grant AGO the power to modify target computers in the execution of a warrant. The legend calls that this actually means. Meaning, the Japanese installation of a monitor program. Yeah. <laughs> 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 